Okay, Brandon, we are live. Welcome, everybody, to Wall Street Reporter's Next Super Stock, a live stream, first day of December 2020. We're closing out the year with a bang. Uh, we have with us Iconic Brands. Once again, we have Brand Co, the CEO. Brandon, welcome back. Thank you for having me. It's great to uh, it's great to be back, Brandon. So uh, you had some tremendous news lately. You have this uh, fantastic uh, uh, revenues. Uh, you have a, you're actually you achieved the EBITDA profitability just announced. Yep. So uh, so congratulations on that number one. Uh, I think the the main question I have is what is what's driving these uh, results, these strong results for iconic brands right now. Yeah. Well, yeah. First off, you know, it was a great, great year for us. Uh, you know, I think obviously to experience the revenue growth that, that we had um, backed up by, you know, being called $560,000 plus in adjusted EBITDA, uh, you know, it was a huge win for our team. Uh, you know, I think, you know, we'd be remiss to to not think about everything that's going on in the world, right? In a normal year, hey, yeah. you know, these results are fantastic, right? But, you know, think about um, what's going on in the world, right? COVID has affected every business. It doesn't really matter what type of service or good that you provide. Uh, every business is getting hurt from COVID. And, and even in the cannabis industry specifically, you know, unfortunately, a lot of our peers, you know, didn't make it through, right? And so not only were we able to survive, but we were able to thrive really growing the revenues dramatically. Um, but I think also equally important, um, you know, turning a, a $560,000 plus uh, positive EBITDA uh, was a was a huge win and a testament to the, to the, to the team. Okay. So what are like, you know, what are the, the key factors that behind this? Is it, I know you have like the kind of, you mentioned this before the three pillar system, you have the technologies, the brands, or what's, you know, like what is, driving the growth and most importantly like is this a preview of 2021 of growth to come in 21 in other words like how much can we kind of uh extrapolate from here into 2021 yeah you know 2020 was always meant as a year to kind of build our foundation right we, we firmly believe that this three pillar system that we created right uh, that involves uh you know our technology and manufacturing process uh, our vertical integration and our sales platform you know, 2020 was always about getting those pieces in place to build a solid foundation uh, for what's to come, right? And so we look at this as really the appetizer, to be honest. And, and uh, you know, 2021 is going to be a huge year for us. It's really the main course. Uh, we're, we're so excited. But again, it, you know, none of that is able to happen unless we've properly built our three pillar system, right? With the sole focus of a superior gross margin profile. And so for us, Again, focusing on, you know, getting back to basics, that appetizer course, if you will, for 2020, and then looking ahead for 2021, it's, it's real, the, it's the main course. And, and now we've kind of can put all of our hard work into action and really kind of are excited for a huge year. Okay. So, so Brandon, so, you know, GE was famous, you know, the Jack Welch form was, was the, the six Sigma. That was the big thing for driving that massive, you know, corporate growth. That was the big thing. And you have this three pillar system for the yep. uh, for, for for the cannabis space. So again, so walk us through the three pillars, and, and also you know I, I think I just realized for any we might have some new people here. So for anybody that that's new, maybe give them an explanation of what what Iconic does. Yeah. So when we came into 2020, it was really about you know how are we going to set ourselves up and and how are we going to build a proper foundation, right? And so. Without the outlines of, of any sort of foundation, you're, you're kind of left, left struggling. And so what we did was we really kind of looked at our business, our competitive advantages, and then kind of building a three pillar system from that to kind of guide us through, you know, this growth that we're going to be experiencing here over the next couple of years. So the first is is technology and our manufacturing process. Right. And so as I uh, mentioned previously, you know, for us, technology is a huge component of our business. Uh, it does two main things. It, it increases efficiency and allows us to scale more effectively, but then it also increases our gross margins dramatically by reducing the need for human capital, right? And so as we've seen in this time of COVID, you know, uh, the workforce and everything going on, it kind of can kind of create chaos, to be honest, right? And so we wanted to kind of, um, you know, work as much as we could to kind of automate that process to ensure that we were able to scale efficiently. Uh, to that end, we, we partnered with some leading engineers out of Silicon Valley a couple of years ago 
um, to build kind of a one of a kind pre-roll automation machine um, that has been in uh, production uh, for us in our actual manufacturing production uh, since earlier this year. Uh, it's, it's added tremendous value to, to what we do on a day to day basis. Um, we're also very excited to say that our second um, machine is currently in production, the manufacturing process. We'll be able to bring it to our manufacturing line, uh, call it Q1 of next year. And so that component will dramatically increase uh, our production capacity, right? We're, we're in a very um, knock on wood lucky position where our demand for our products is outstripping our, our ability to manufacture, right? And so to that end, we've uh, decided to bring on a second machine that will be ready in Q1. Uh, but also, you know, we're moving to a new headquarters in Northern California. It's about 20 miles from where we're currently at. Um, two main benefits, right? We're almost going to almost three times the size of our existing manufacturing facility, right? So adds tremendous capacity uh, to, to what we're doing. And then it's also in a, a city tax free zone, right? Which again, uh, unfortunately no one likes paying taxes and, and we're no different And uh, you know, making this move helps us pull from an output perspective and then also a bottom line perspective. Okay. So, so basically the, uh, okay. So, uh, you know, again, we, we have a lot of new people, so I think they really kind of need to understand so the technology behind, uh, you know, which is the rolling technology for, you know, rolling the uh, uh, the the joints, right? Sure. <laughs> the the Ganja Gold. Okay, so Ganja Gold is, is so basically right now you have what two? You have is it really like two main brands? You have Taylor's and Ganja Gold. Is that the two? Yeah, two main brands right now in California. Um, you know, deep pipeline of of uh, acquisitions and other kind of uh, organic brands that we're working on bringing to the market. But yeah, you know, Ganja Gold is the category leader, one of the category leaders in the infused pre roll space, right? And so to be a category leader in the most competitive market in all of the world is a huge win for us and something that we're very proud of. It's a premium product, premium brand, premium potency, right? So it speaks to a specific demographic of the consumer or the consumer landscape. Uh, we also created a brand called Taylor's, right? So we saw that, you know, through all of our data and through, you know, our sales team, you know, seven member team being on the ground throughout the state, we realized that um, you know the market was underserved from a standpoint of, of a value pre-roll that's still over-delivered in quality, right? So because of our technology, because of our vertical integration, because of our um, you know sales platform, again our, our three pillar system, we were able to bring to market a, a product that fit the, the need of you know one of the largest consumer um, segments in the market, which is that that value-oriented um, segment. Two dollar and seventy five wholesale, one gram um, pre roll um, with uh, with very good margins on top of that. So yeah, we're we're very excited and have been very pleased. And I think most importantly, the feedback from the end consumers and the bud tenders and the buyers has been very very positive. And so you know that'll be a big theme for us in twenty twenty one. Okay, so I think the main thing. I mean, one one of the part of the one of the pillars is the 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 technology, the manufacturing. So essentially. Iconic has a, you know, a real competitive advantage with your, you know, the the, the pre-roll, the manufacturing technology, right? It's, nobody else has this, and, and this essentially what it allows you to to have a Can you maybe explain to our audience like what you know really the competitive advantage you have with your you know pre-roll technology and what it really means going forward? Because now you you just mentioned. Uh, which is something very important. You're gonna have a, a second machine, so yep. essentially you can double or more the the, yep. the revenues. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it's a great point, right? So for the audience who may not kind of fully understand, you know, they just see a product on shelves and and maybe not understanding how it's fully made. But you know, pre rolls to date have been made in a very manual process, right? It requires a huge labor force, and if you want to double your output, you're having to double your entire team. Right. And obviously in a COVID situation, you know, that can become very difficult. Right. You're, you're trying to adhere to the, the standards and the, the social distancing and all the components. Right. Just space in general. And so, you know, manually producing pre-rolls is a very labor intensive, time intensive and costs um, a, a lot to kind of produce. Right. And so what our technology does is it allows us to create a consistent product time and time again with no human error or, or potential for human error. 
it allows us to also scale efficiently and quickly without the need for um, a lot of you know human labor, right? So the ability to have a machine kind of eventually go 24 seven with a minimal workforce uh, is a huge advantage, right? Now you throw in the idea of bringing on a second machine and to your point, it doubles capacity overnight, right? But again, we're only operating on kind of one production shift, right? We're doing eight hours a day uh, in Oakland uh, in our kind of 2,700 square foot facility. And so you add on a three times the size of square foot facility, you add on a second machine, which double capacity out of the gate. And then you look at adding on a second shift for both machines and eventually a third mach- uh, a shift. You know, we think that, um, you know, having these pieces in place, again, allows us to scale um, efficiently and effectively very fast. Okay. So this is, okay. So this is, I think this is the key takeaway here from today's, from, from the, so basically right now, Iconic is at an, really at an inflection point where you're adding the second machine, yep. you can increasing, you know, the shift larger. So essentially you can, you can take revenues up. Uh, am I doing the math? Is it four X because two machines double? I mean, or what's the math? Yeah. I mean, you know, you could, you could think about it from that standpoint, right? If we are running one shift, one machine today, right? Um, if we add on a second machine, same capacity, that doubles, right? And then we add both those machines doing second shifts, right? That's a 4X, right? And then if we're able to kind of go to a three shift system, 24 hours a day, again, because we don't have a huge labor force with respect to the machine, you know, you could have dramatic growth, right? And that's why we really say like, you know, 2020 was the appetizer, right? You know, 2021 is is the real main course. And, and again, it's one thing to say, you know, we think that we're ready for the main course. It's another thing to have the pieces fully funded in place, ready to go. And, and that's why we're so excited. Okay. This is uh uh for, okay so we're gonna we're gonna get into the questions uh in, in, in just a second uh but i think also you know one of the things again which is i think people really uh kind of need to understand is, is that with this technology the pre-roll manufacturing technology brian can you explain like like right now we're seeing an all the all, all the the earnings calls from all the, the companies in the cannabis space you know the one word where well, two things you hear the two big themes is branding branding and, and focus on profitability, right? So how does your, so it seems like the, 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 the ability to create, to manufacture a consistent quality product is a key to brands. Like, like you know, so maybe can you explain how your technology can help? Let's say if you, white, you know, do white labels, you do joint ventures, whatever deals you do, how that could, or maybe it could be of strategic interest to some of the big players in the space who are serious about, you know, building brands. Yeah, yeah. For us, you know, this this technology is huge from the standpoint of, to your point, giving that customer the same consistent product time and time again, right? Um, that's all that any consumer wants, right? They want to know that every time they're buying a product, they're getting that same consistency. And quite frankly, technology and automation ensures that we're, we're, we're giving that consumer that consistency. To your point, you know, we've talked to a lot of the larger brands in the state or, or brands that want to get into the state. And again, building a huge manufacturing team to manufacture pre-rolls is a very risky, costly endeavor, right? And so a lot of these larger brands don't want it, but yet they do want to sell pre-rolls, right? And so again, if you're looking at two options, one is, you know, a team of 50, 60 people, and the other is a team of four or five and uh, technology, right? You know that you're going to go with that technology because you're going to get consistency, right? So it's no different. Companies are looking at kind of our white label solution, no different than we look at it ourselves, right? We want consistency and we want it at a, at, at a, um, at a good price, right? And so we're taking that same model and now looking at how do we expand this technology? How do we leverage this technology to work with, you know, some of the larger brands who want to get into this space in pre-rolls uh, and or who are having issues today just keeping up with their own demand? So it really, I, I, it seems to me that essentially your technology is kind of, is is the answer to a lot of the, the challenges that, you know, the companies have in the space, if, if they want to be in the pre-roll space. Yeah. 
Yeah, the, the pre-roll market in 19, 2019 was almost was only 9% of the total addressable market in the state. Now, if we've seen anything from, let's take cigarettes, right? No one rolls their own cigarettes today. Now, back when cigarettes first started going, everyone rolled it. But as technology improved, right, and you were able to get that kind of consistent um, product, right, that kind of saved you time, you know, everyone went to, you know, effectively a rolled cigarette. Now, the cannabis space is, is much tougher to kind of replicate, right? There's a lot of things that go into a pre-roll, whether it be the consistency of the flower that's changing on a, on a daily basis, whether it be, you know, the cones that are, you know, thin would be generous. So, you know, for us, it was really tough to find a solution. Um, and, and that's why we honestly, you know, partnered and, and created our own, right? We couldn't find a technology solution that delivered a quality product that the consumer would appreciate. Um, but we do think that as we put our products into the market and as pre-rolls become more and more available, you know, that that 10% number is, is going to grow dramatically. And so we're, we're excited to be at kind of that forefront of that growth um, heading into kind of next year. So, you know, also another another point and I'll go into the questions right after this is that, you know, really it's, I think one of the things that, you know, I think a lot of people do want to have the pre-roll product, right? They, they want to smoke uh, the cannabis. Mm -hmm. uh, it, the problem has been that the existing pre-rolls were not, the quality wasn't there. They, were, they weren't able to get a consistent quality product or whatever it is, or the, the cost of it. And this essentially, you know, solves that, that problem. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I, I think that without technology and without kind of this automation and, you know, without really our kind of three pillar system, right. For a lot of companies, it's not very profitable to do pre-rolls, right. We've been able to kind of flip the script, but it's really based on our three pillar system that we're able to actually make products at a, at a, at a high gross margin and deliver those to the consumer. Right. And so, you know, we're just seeing something where, Again, without the technology, without the vertical integration, without the sales platform, you know, it doesn't become a profitable endeavor for businesses, right? And so that's where we think we just have such a, a huge strategic advantage because we know that we can do it profitably. Uh, and that's why, honestly, not only are we going to be doing our products, but, you know, we think that uh, we know that we're going to have a, a large customer base of, of white label customers who, you know, effectively want our, our, our solution. Okay. Uh, okay. So let's jump into let's jump into some questions here. Um, okay. So first we got Ben. Congratulations on achieving massive increases of revenues. Uh, Hammy is back. Hammy is asking uh, any projections for Q1 revenue, and will those be out this month? You know, we will be um, putting out our. Um, I guess Q1 fiscal 2020 uh, later in December. Um, so the, the the financial results that we just put out, it was actually for the year end of, of uh, July 31st, right? And so we'll be putting out our next quarter results uh, very quick. And, and at that time, we'll look to kind of um, you know guide the market on kind of what what our expectation is for this year or for this coming year. But again, we uh, we're very excited. It really you know this year was really the appetizer, and uh, you know it's time to bring on the main course. Okay. Uh, Mila is asking, what do you think about the Congress hearing results on cannabis in USA? Uh, Europe is per many usages of cannabis. What about US? Uh, maybe you can, um, Brent, maybe you can talk about like what's happening right now, um, you know, in, in terms of uh, legislation, the US also in Europe, I think Europe is opening up now, right? Yeah. So, you know, I'll, I'll speak to kind of the, the US opportunity and, and it's providing, you know, tremendous, um, excitement for the space, right? Obviously with, uh, with the election uh, and the new administration, um, you know, again, have, have been very pro cannabis in kind of the, the commentary, right? Obviously four states uh, passed this year, rec uh, and another uh, medical, right? So states are toppling over very fast. Uh, the other thing we're seeing is that states are also looking for additional ways to drive uh, revenue, right? And, and they're seeing their peers in states where cannabis is legalized and they're seeing the tax base that they've kind of created. And we think that that's going to be a huge factor, right? So we think that as, as more and more states open up, obviously we're, we're excited about federal legalization, right? We think it provides this tremendous opportunity, right? You know, no other businesses right now are kind of handcuffed to 
you know, the specific state that you might operate, right? And not being able to kind of cross state lines. But if you think about every other business, right? Um, whether it's, uh, you know, beverage or food, you know, you're manufacturing in one place and you're shipping out across uh, the U.S., right? And so I think it's no different than Napa Valley wine. You know, the reason that we chose California is it's the most competitive market with the most discerning customer. And if we can own that, uh, we know that our product and our brands will, will transfer very well as uh, federal legalization comes uh, becomes a reality. Okay. And speaking of that, you're, you're in, you're, what, what are the plans for Nevada for? What's happening in Nevada right, with you right now and, and for next year? Yeah, so we're, we're really excited about uh, Nevada. Um, you know, we, we acquired, uh, as part of a previous acquisition, we acquired uh, a, a vertically integrated asset. So we have a, a manufacturing facility. We have cultivation all on a one and a half acre um, campus, I guess, that you'd call it, that, that we own outright. Uh, so we own the dirt as well. Um, in Q1 of, of, you know, calendar 2021, uh, we will be bringing our Ganja Gold products to the market. Uh, we've talked to uh, all the big retailers. Uh, they're very excited to, to have this product. Um, you know, the, the feedback that we get is that there's nothing like it in the market, and we know that we'll do very well. Um, but it also has helped. Uh, we, we own a, uh, a brand called Just Edibles that's currently in the market in Nevada, right? And so what it's done is it's really paved the way from a sales perspective so that as we bring to market Ganja Gold and the Tarantula, right, we'll have a, a lot of existing sales channels, the, the biggest ones in the state, to kind of slide our products right in. So, um, you know, again, the, the the path is there, the vertically integrated infrastructure is there, the sales platform's there, and it's just about bringing uh, those Ganja Gold products to market um, in, in the uh, the first bit of 2021. Okay, so in case people, you know, outside of the U.S., they don't they don't know where Nevada is. It's it's we're talking about Las Vegas mostly, right? Las Vegas, that it's, uh, you know, Vegas has, has opened up, you know, obviously it was hit hard in the, in the early days of, of COVID given the, the tourism, but, you know, I can tell you it's, it's alive and well, and we're excited to, uh, to bring our, our further bring our products to the, to the Nevada market. And it's a huge market, right? It's, I mean, it's becoming like a massive market. I mean, this, you know, in the, in the retail end of it. Yeah, yeah, huge, huge loyal customer base in Nevada. Um, that's kind of full time in Nevada, and then you you consider all the tourism, right? All the conferences that you know will come back, right? Um, it just presents a huge opportunity, um, you know. And again, I think Nevada is the perfect market, right? People don't really have time, right? That they they come there for. <laughs> Uh, and and uh, you know they don't instant want gratification. They want they they don't want to roll a joint. They want instant gratification. They get it right there. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, you know, I, I think actually, I from what I I what, the, what somebody was telling me uh, who was in the in the music business, I I, I met out there was telling me that. Uh, do you know what is it, have you do you know what Wiz Khalifa? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know what music by. <laughs> I love this name. So so this is, he was telling me this guy had you know it, part of his contract on tour was. He had his own guy to roll the joints. Yeah, that was part of the thing. So imagine how much money he could have saved. Oh, I know. We we should uh, we should I'm get him like real fast. Uh, we we have a better solution for him. Exactly. Yeah, you don't need to roll. You know, this is it's we're in the twenty first century now. Exactly. Uh, okay, so Jeremy's asking um, any patents or other obstacles for competitors. What's your moat, Brandon? Yeah. What is your moat? Part of it is that, you know, this process has been very, very difficult and a lot of people have tried to do it. But, you know, I think where we really have excelled is we've married technology with actual uh, with an actual leading brand in the space. Right. So it's one thing to kind of create technology in a bubble and say, oh, I hope this works and not really iterate on it, not really kind of test it in the real world. And then it's another thing for brands to just say, yeah, I wish we had technology that, you know, could do this. And so really, I think the, the, the secret sauce of what we've been able to do is really marry that technology with a leading brand. Right. And so we're getting real time live feedback on a daily, daily basis to make it better, more efficient, you know, you name it. Right. And so, again, I think that's really been the secret sauce of what we've been able to do is really kind of marrying the two uh, to really kind of create a best in breed um, piece of technology, but then also allowing that to kind of filter down to really kind of give us a best of breed product. Okay. 
Uh, Jordan is asking about edibles. Yeah. So, um, you know, edibles in the new facility, you know, for right now, our focus in California, at least, is pre-rolls and what we call light derivatives, right? Obviously, we we have tremendous learnings now from our edibles brand in Nevada, right? Um, you know, if the numbers make sense uh, and we find that there is a huge market opportunity for us in California, the good thing is, is that we already have the manufacturing facility. We already have the sales team on the ground in California. So it would be an easy transition for us to bring a edible company, um, whether it be our own or whether it be one that we look at acquiring uh, to the California market. Um, but for right now, we're, we're you know, kind of heads down, um, you know, trying to bring the best pre-rolls uh, to the market. But um, but yeah, it, it makes a lot of sense for us in the future, given kind of this three pillar system and, and how um, kind of mobile we could become for, for edibles in the state. Okay, so we have two related questions here. Uh, I think they're related. So we have Hammy's asking, what are you projecting for revenue 2021? Okay, so for revenue. And Mila is asking, what are your projections for demand? in 2021. Yeah. So, you know, we, we will, um, most likely bring our official projections, uh, to the market in kind of early 2021, right. Uh, we're going through that process right now and kind of, you know, a lot of it is trying to measure the demand quite frankly, right. And not many companies, not many companies I've been a part of, I guess, have the problem where they have too much demand. Right. And so, um, we're really trying to, de to meet the demand, um, through our production capacity. Uh, and again, as evidence, getting a, a facility that's three times the size, bringing on a second machine, you know, really trying to pump out production to kind of meet that demand curve has been, you know, uh, it's been a real goal of ours. And we think that, uh, you know, in 2021, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to have those kind of uh, hopefully meets, but uh, yeah, the demand, you know, we, we've just been blown away with the demand for our products. And I, I think it speaks to, we're putting out quality premium products, right? We're doing it because we're technology based and we can deliver the same product time and time again. Uh, and quite frankly, a, a lot of companies aren't able to do that. So I think customers are really appreciating that consistency that they're getting time and time again. Okay, uh, we get a question. Uh, do you sell your products in Canada? Oh, this is coming from Periscope, not YouTube, Periscope. Uh, do you sell your products in Canada and uh, can you license the tech for generic labels, right? for white label, I guess? Yeah. So um, our, our, our products aren't currently sold in Canada, right? Um, it, it's uh, it's just solely the California and Nevada market right now. Um, you know, for us to, you know, our focus is really going to be how do we white label for other big brands? Not necessarily how do we license the technology, right? We think that it obviously provides us a tremendous competitive advantage. Uh, we have the manufacturing expertise and the technology expertise. Um, so, you know, if anything, the strategy will be us working with larger um, companies who need scale quickly in the pre-roll or infused pre-roll space and, and using that as a revenue um, source for us. So, yeah, we will be, um, you know, in the first half of next year, we will be bringing online white label customers and we'll be doing that all in-house. Okay. Doug is asking, what sets you apart from other cannabis companies? Just machine rolled or something else? Yeah. You know, we'd like to say that it's really built around our three pillar system, right? From our experience, um, you know, we are really trying to bring uh, and really kind of combine the best of legacy uh, cannabis and the best of kind of business expertise from outside industries, right? So we think that's really um, that that kind of concept kind of filters down to everything that we do, right? We think that, um, you know, our focus on our superior gross margin backed up by our three pillar system really sets us apart. Um, you know, we have a tremendous team, right? Again, um, a lot of cannabis uh, legacy expertise, but then also a lot of kind of traditional business expertise. And so I think all of those factors really kind of set us apart at the end of the day. Um, you know, you could have the pieces in place, but you know, without execution, you know, you're, you're nowhere. And I think, you know, based on the results that we've put out this morning of really growing our top line significantly, and I think almost as equally important being able to be, you know, a 500,000 uh, plus positive uh, EBITDA is a testament to, you know, not only the pieces being in place, but actually our ability to actually execute. 
Okay, uh, we got an interesting question coming from Ben. How many machines will you need when Philip Morris starts banging on the door? <laughs> Yeah, that, that that's going to be a great problem to have, right? And as I said before, you know, the idea of a pre-roll machine sounds easy because people point to canning and bottling, people point to cigarettes, and they think it's just a really easy process, right? But, you know, the fact is, is that because the inputs are so dramatically different, right? Every strain has a different consistency. Even the same strain grown at different types of the different times of the year have a different consistency, right? And so with automation. The whole goal is same input, same output. But if the inputs are constantly changing, you need a piece of technology that is flexible enough to handle those inputs uh, and the variances in, in those, but still deliver the same quality output. So again, we will, we will build machines as we have uh, the need for our own internal use, both for our own brands and our white label businesses, you know, both in California and as we expand. And then, you know, the uh, the future will look pretty bright and, and we'll handle the uh, the Philip Morris's accordingly as they come knocking. Okay. So, you know, it's a very interesting. So it's like, you know, because it's essentially, it's uh, cannabis powered by technology. So just like, uh, you know, you know, what Tesla has done for cars, you know, you're doing for cannabis. You're the Tesla of cannabis. Yeah. We, we'd like to say that, uh, you know, I think that's a great point, right? But if you think about like, you know, there's also a lot of electric, electric car companies that no one knows about, right? So not only do you have to have technology that's different, like a Tesla, you also have to have a brand that's well known and recognized like Tesla, right? If you have the brand and you have the technology and the systems to back it up, then you have a winning combination. I think, to be honest, one without the other, you know, you don't really, you can't really achieve much. Okay, uh, we got time for a few more questions. Brandon, we're going to have you back, I think, uh, next week for an update because I know you have a couple things happening, right? Yeah, yeah, that's the uh, that's the goal. Okay, okay, so let's 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 uh, let's finish up with a couple questions here. Uh, so we got Philip. Okay, so uh, does your team have a formal white label product offering, or is in the pipeline? And if so, are such contracts in process? So what is your first mover advantage? Yeah, so, um, yeah, we'll, we'll be bringing that. Um, you know, we have a, a good pipeline of of customers. Again, you know, it's all production capacity related, right? Uh, you know, we have we have over demand for our own products right now. So to take on white label customers uh, when we can't even fulfill the the massive orders that we have, it, you know, isn't isn't smart. But again, with the addition of our of our much larger production facility, with the addition of our second machine, and then the second shift concept, right? In Q1 of next year, we will be able to kind of bring those customers online. The reality is, is we're not as concerned with the first mover advantage because this is a tough thing to do, right? Um, you know, these customers uh, who want uh, pre-roll solutions can go elsewhere, right? They can work with the large labor forces and get kind of somewhat inconsistent products or, or pay more uh, because of the cost of labor. Uh, so we know that, you know, when we do turn on this switch, uh, we'll have no shortage of, of folks to work with. Um, so, you know, we're, we're not as concerned with the first mover advantage given our strategic advantages when it comes to technology. Okay. Uh, Jeremy's asking, can you transport pre-rolls from California to Nevada? Yeah, you, you can't. Um, you know, every state is obviously different. And so that kind of presents the opportunity and the problem with the industry, right? Uh, you have to kind of, uh, you know, it's not the most efficient because you have to set up, um, you know, a, a full manufacturing process, full manufacturing team and facility in every state uh, because you can't transport. But, you know, that is obviously one of the things that federal legalization will really enhance is the idea that you can transport eventually. And so that's where, we're, you know, we're just really excited. Um, you know, we think that there'll be huge economies at scale for us to centralize manufacturing, centralize cultivation, and then be able to distribute our products, um, you know, across across the U.S. Uh, so Cassie was asking, are you planning to add a third machine in Nevada, in Las Vegas? Yeah, so so we will find a solution technology wise, right? Um, to you know, for for Nevada, obviously, you know, it's part of the story, part of the process, and and as we kind of get scale, we'll bring um, that technology to Nevada in order to ensure that we're able to kind of achieve that that same gross margin profile that we're after. Uh, so yeah, so that'll be a most likely a twenty twenty one story. 
Okay, so uh, he's asking, is Planet 13 uh, your client? Yeah, so um, our, um, our our Just Edibles products uh, are, are selling in Planet 13. Obviously, they've been a great, great partner of ours and, and you know, someone that, um, you know, we'll, we'll lean on as we kind of bring our Ganja Gold products. But yeah, our Just Edibles products are being sold at Planet 13. Okay, so um, here we go. This, this, this question this is the rockets the rockets taking off this this kind of summarizes uh i can right now uh we got okay so 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 brandon to summarize um uh things are you're at an inflection point uh i think things are about to kick into into gear w what about m a opportunities are you i think you mentioned that once before are you looking at any potential m a opportunities at some point uh soon yeah yeah i mean it's um a lot of conversations are happening right now. I think for us, looking at M and A opportunities, you know, growth is going to come organically, but it's also going to come through acquisition, right? And so we're looking at acquisitions that make sense for us, that are uh, you know uh, accredited to the shareholders, that can really add value, right? We think that you know with this three pillar system, we've been able to build a foundation that um, you know is again right for growth in 2021 and, and acquisitions are gonna be a, a large component of that story, right? Whether it be acquisitions that better our process, better our team, better you know, the way that we manufacture, uh, whether it's brands out there that um, you know, we can do it kind of cheaper, more efficiently, um, you know, we're gonna look at all opportunities really with the goal of, of you know, how do we create shareholder value, right? That's really what we're trying to do and, and um, you know, acquisitions are going to be a big theme for us in 2021. Okay. Uh, and uh, let's see here. What, um, I guess the, the last question, you know, which is our, our, our favorite question at the Wall Street Reporter is, you know, right now, where, where things stand today, in your opinion, top three reasons for investors to want to own ICANN. Yeah. So again, uh, very excited about this coming year. Uh, you know, the first reason why you, you own this company, right? Uh, we are different, right? We are technology focused, technology based, which allows us to scale efficiently and more profitably um, than most, right? And I think it's evidenced by, you know, these financial results that we just put out. I mean, not only were we, we able to grow, but we were able to do it efficiently and and, uh, and and kind of you know ultimately drive a, a positive EBITDA, which is huge in this industry, right? And so part of it's that a is a milestone. This is actually a very important milestone for ICANN. It's a huge milestone for us, right? Think about it. We're just just getting going, right? So the appetizer tasted good. The main course should taste better. The second component is again we are focused on our superior gross margin profile, right? Um, it's a very different approach than a lot of companies take. Our focus is to ensure that, again, we're growing, but also that we're growing through our superior gross margin profile that's really based on our three pillar system, right? And then the, the last component is just, you know, we think that growth is going to be huge in 2021, right? We think that it's going to come from organic growth through our existing brands, our white label business. Uh, but then we're also excited, uh, very excited based on the conversations that we've been having around acquisitions, right? We think that it's a huge opportunity. The market is 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 ripe for consolidation, but only doing so when it when it's accretive to the shareholders, when it creates value to the shareholders, because uh, that is our big focus. So yeah, we think again, um, you know, this year has been about uh, building that foundation, and, and 2021 uh, is really the year for growth. Okay, so Brandon, uh, so we're gonna have you back, I guess, uh, next week, or or maybe even sooner, maybe even sooner. So, so on that note, uh, Brandon, I want to thank you again for joining us, uh, and we'll see you again uh, within a week or so. Sounds great. Yeah, looking forward to uh, you having me back, and um, have a great day. And we're looking for major news, of course. Always. Thank Always. you, Brandon. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. So Brandon, uh, thank you. Uh, and let's get ready for our next presenter. Uh, we have ESE Entertainment. Okay. We got the, we're going to bring on the CEO in just one second. So stand by. Let me get this uh, set up here. Uh, Okay, just so you guys know, this is, you know, we're only looking for 
10 bagger stocks here, 10 bagger stocks. So ICANN is moving up and uh, we got uh, ESE next. All right. Okay, let's get uh, Conrad on. Conrad. Jack, how are you? Fantastic. How are you doing? Amazing, man. Okay, okay. Uh, we got uh, are you, we got everything ready there. We got uh, everything on the screen is looking good. We're always ready. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I like to hear. That's what I feel. Let me just let me just get some water here. It's been a long hour. Oh yeah, I'm gonna come after you a little bit today. <laughs> Excellent. Um, okay, so let me get. Uh, let's see what do we have. Okay. Oh, we got a lot of people coming in here. We got people on on YouTube, on Periscope. We're also on, um, what is it? Uh, not Discord, what's the other one? The um, the one that Amazon has, uh, the uh, the gaming one. Discord. Is it, no, there's, there's another one. There's, uh, what is it called? Uh, it is, what is this thing called here? It is called, I, I, I see their logo, I don't know what it's called. <laughs> We're on like five streams at once. All right, <laughs> all right, so let's get, um, let me get this ready for our maybe uh, maybe Twitch, Jack. You're speaking Twitch. Twitch. We're on Twitch also, Twitch, which is very appropriate. So uh, let's see. Okay, so let me get uh, set up here for the the video. Okay. Welcome everybody to Wall Street Reporters next super stock live stream for today, the first of December 2020. We have a debut presentation from what could be our next 10 bagger stock, 10 bagger or more, uh, which means 10 bagger for those who don't know the term, means a stock that is up 10X, that's 1000%. Company is ESE Entertainment, ESE on the TSX Venture and ENTEF over the counter. Uh, the CEO we have here is Conrad Vasella. Conrad, am I pronouncing the name correctly? I like it, man, it's good. I say hello. Okay. Conrad, welcome. Thanks, Jack, man. It's a pleasure to be on and we're really fired up over here to be on. Hey, well, the stock is moving. You got some some incredible volume since, uh, you, you know, we announced uh, the presentation. So there's a lot of investors who are you know, obviously very excited about what you're doing, the potential and everything. Um, so I think what we're going to do is uh, now we're going to have you, you're going to do a, a presentation. We're going to show some demos, some video. And then we'll, we'll I'll jump back on and we'll we'll go to Q and A. Yeah, I'd I'd love to just give a nice overview of ESE Entertainment uh, as a whole. Uh, really dive into some details and show you some demos, and then dive into some Q and A and just fire it up with the viewers and uh, you know just start that process. Okay, perfect. Yeah, Twitch. That was the one. Yeah. I, oh, yeah, I see the comments. Okay, okay. Discord. Okay, we got Montana here. Uh, all right, so let's uh, let's get uh, this set up here. Okay, uh, so Brandon, uh, take it away, and I will see you in uh, in a few minutes. Great. All right, guys, pleasure to be on. So our company is ESE Entertainment Inc. Recently listed in August on the TSX Venture symbol ESE, and on the OTC symbol ENTEF. So the big question, what are esports? To simplify, esports is competitive sport using video games. And there's no better way to show you this than the 2019 Fortnite World Championships. So let's just watch this quick clip here. Look at the buzz here, guys. Pack Stadium, 3 million US dollars on the line. This is what esports is all about. And this is why it surpassed over a billion in 2019 revenues. And more exciting than that, 25% year over year growth. As I mentioned, Kyle won 3 million US that day. So Europe, one of the largest markets in the world, over 580 million online population, 32 plus million esports enthusiasts, and it's growing fast. And ESE is right in the thick of it. So ESE is a world-class esports infrastructure company. 
Our core business lines fall under two categories, technology and our gaming franchise. As it pertains to technology, we have a digital tournament software, an e-commerce software, and we also have a simulation racing and 3D track scanning capabilities. Our gaming franchise, we have exclusive digital media rights. We have a professional esports team called Kick, and we manage and own our own tournaments and leagues. Some highlights. Europe is wide open for consolidation and we have first mover advantage. We have a diversified business model scaled through technology in our gaming franchise. This is an exceptional market opportunity as gaming is a global mega trend and esports is leading the way. And our management team is simply world class. And I think our partners and sponsors speak to that. And let's dive into what our team has actually done. So this is an event we put on for Porsche. And this is a sim racing event that was on live TV throughout Europe on 11 sports TV channel. And the exciting part, guys, is sim racing is a huge upside. We have, after performing this event with Porsche, we've had unbelievable response from other very large automotive companies most notably Kia and Mercedes-Benz, and we're working on several others. So this just shows you the future of sim racing and how big this could be. I mean, it's really exciting. So let's jump into the opportunity. So there's no dominant infrastructure company powering esports. There's fragmented cha channels as it pertains to uh, esports companies. That's why they're really struggling to generate revenue lack of standardization, lack of permanent digital and physical infrastructure for supporting events, and it's difficult to manage global broadcasting and advertising channels. So what's the solution? ESE is the solution, a world-class infrastructure company that has the software for events and tournaments, that has physical infrastructure and broadcasting capabilities. We have existing global distribution for esports related content, and we have tier one advertising and sponsorship partners in place and our growing gaming franchise kick is primed for growth so our company assets this is how we make money so if you break it into technology and a gaming franchise our digital tournament software allows us to license to license and then we create licensing revenue our e-commerce platform we sell products and we have affiliate revenues our simulation racing, we provide 3D track scanning and we implement our event into the game Assetto Corsa. Our gaming franchise, we have exclusive digital media rights. So we have the sale of digital media rights for sporting events, esports events. Our professional esports team, we're constantly in, in uh, tournaments and there's winnings and sponsorships. Now that generates revenue for kick and our wholly owned and managed leagues. We have setup fees and entry fees for those tournaments and the games we're involved in apex legends, Rocky league, league of legends, FIFA and Assetto Corsa to name a few technology distribution on our customers. This is where we get into the big stuff guys. So our technology partner meta. So meta is a proprietary technology that runs and operates our digital esports and gaming events. They have over a million plus impressions a month, 30,000 plus competitive gamer profiles, over 25 countries and in 18 games. Something to note, they were chosen as the platform for Razer uh, to host the 2019 Southeast Asia games. And our deal with Meta is an exclusivity uh, for Europe and the company has a 50-50 split on profits from that partnership distribution esports tv also known as estv esc is helping them expand into europe with these monsters amazon fire samsung tv sling watch revisio roku tv so a huge opportunity for distribution there another one of our partners uh polsat a multi-billion dollar media conglomerate based in europe we have exclusive licenses with Riot Games and Polsat to participate in a tournament within League of Legends, in the game League of Legends. And this tournament has over 24 million views annually. 
So if you look at the photo here, guys, this is actually a photo of the studio, the Polsat studio. It's world class. It's over 30 million year, 30 million euro uh, they invested into that studio. So another key customer, Porsche. I mean, it speaks for itself. They trusted us with their esports and gaming activations. And I think that just kind of says it all. Orlin, another multi-billion dollar company we're partnered with. It's a large oil and gas company based in Europe. And ESE has a deal to manage and run certain gaming and esports events on behalf of Orlin. The executive team, there I am. I'm the founder and CEO. I uh, founded a global real estate and private equity company. I played professional sports uh, football for over five years. And I've been involved in gaming and esports for over 10, working with the biggest guys in the industry, EA Sports, Flutter Entertainment, Take-Two Interactive, all the big guys. Rob Kang's our CFO. He's a former director of listings for the TSX Venture Exchange, and he has over 20 plus years in experience in capital markets. JJ, the director of EO operations, over 20 years experience in esports and sports. This guy's done it all on a global scale. He does, he's executed on world-class events like the World Track, Track Cycling Championships to note. Michael Mango, director of marketing. He's just an esports and gaming nerd and he loves it. He's a co-founder of the first sociological study on esports and gaming in Poland. And he's been a part of some of the best teams in the world. Pedro Fernandez, he's a director of our kick franchise. He's a living legend uh, in the space. He's led the kick team to over 800 awards and 500 tournament wins. Our current focus, revenue. Aggressively focused on top line sales and margin expansion. Our mergers and acquisitions execute only on accretive acquisitions. Expanding our global distribution, continue to sign those large scale deals for distributions in the US and Asia, and increase the value of our gaming franchise, Kick. Continue to push the Kick brand globally and make it the next big brand. Comparables, this is exciting, guys. Follow along. You have score at the bottom 670 million market cap, esports entertainment group, 71 million market cap. Engine Media, 70 million market cap. EGLX, Enthusiast Gaming, 310 million market cap. We are at 18.9 million market cap as of yesterday's closing price. So this shows you the tremendous opportunity and ground floor opportunity. We're primed for growth. Our capital structure overview, once again, this is based on yesterday's closing price. We closed at 49 cents market cap of 18.9 million insider holdings of over 50 percent and very tightly held basic shares out 38.6 million i really want to note that this is a tight structure and primed for growth that kind of wraps it up for me jack uh, really excited to jump into the q a and give the viewers some more insight okay uh let's get this on the screen we've got some questions coming in i got a few questions for you first and then we'll you know we'll, we'll get we'll get to the 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 audience questions i know we're gonna have a lot of questions so so kind of right so so the first thing is uh well, you know you're actually i think you're the first ceo we've had on uh who's been wearing a suit and tie uh well actually no there's 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 since since uh your predecessor was a company that went from very similar stock price from 50 cents to ten dollars and one cent that was cytodyne so it took Cytodyne about uh, uh, 11 months to get there. And that guy, that was uh, not there. Not there would always uh, show up on a suit and tie. So this is uh, maybe, maybe lightning will strike twice. Or, or we just continue to deliver and we get there. Ab absolutely. So, so he kind of, so he is, can you kind of tell the audience a little bit more about, about your background? Like, you know, you, you played foot, I don't know, you played football, you, you, you were in, in real estate. What, what have you What have you been doing? Yeah, so I'm a former professional athlete. I played over five years in the Canadian Football League, uh, and that was one of my dreams growing up. You know, my passion. I was able to get there, uh, and very proud to be able to play at the highest level in the world in football. 
Uh, as it pertains to business, I've always been an entrepreneur since I could remember, since I was a little kid. Uh, always had a vision for a billion dollar company and i think this is the one that's going to be the next billion dollar company uh, but i've been very successful i was able to build a global real estate holding company uh, with over 10 plus million in assets uh, and i've invested in some gaming and esports deals in the past and i've built those to multi-million dollar revenue companies as well uh, but now it's just 100 percent focus on esc i'm absolutely obsessed uh, anyone who knows me will tell you this is just the beginning okay yeah we, ha we actually we, have, we got some 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 uh, people in the audience uh they have been uh they we got some guys saying they know you they've they're saying you're you're an impressive guy we got hang on a second what, what do we have here we have rahul rahul do you know this guy rahul we got some we got a lot a lot, <laughs> a lot of positive a lot oh, of yeah. positive a lot of positive comments here which is always important look i think i think with they're not they're and they're not hiding they're not having they're not, they're they're not, they're not, yeah, they're not getting paid right these are not paid uh <laughs> so um no, absolutely so maybe, not. yeah because i think what's interesting is uh you know in the micro cap space i always find that the, the, it's the ceo of the company that, that it, it's it's really important because that is you know ultimately i think investors it's important to have uh, a ceo that knows how to you know uh as opportunity seize those opportunities pivot when things you know uh you know problems pop up which they always do in any type of business and we've had a lot of our clients uh, you know companies yeah you know, they things happen yet COVID, yet this yet that and and the ones that uh were were successful were the the guys who were able to, to pivot so that's that's you know an absolutely critical um so i want to ask you uh, a couple things first of all you know just so you know uh to get to right to the right to get to the bottom line you know our audience they're looking for you know stocks which have that 10x to 100x upside so they want to know how esc can go from you know 50 cents today to let's say five dollars plus now normally we would say over the next you know 18 months 24 months but you know our audience has been very spoiled because we've had a bunch of you know 10 baggers 20 baggers in the last few months so now you know they want it now they want that they want that 10 bagger right now you know and, and since you're in esports you know everybody you know all the millennials they want instant gratification so what's the path what's the path for esc to be a uh, five dollar stock well let's make it clear right off the bat we have a clear vision both internally and corporately that we want to be a billion dollar company and that's that's the we're laser focused on that that's step number one number two consolidation our acquisition pipeline is primed and ready and i think that's going to be the play we're going to go out and execute only on accretive acquisitions we're going to bring on partners that generate revenue and have profitability and we're going to continue to grow and layer our business and three, we're going to build the biggest esports infrastructure company in the world. Okay. Uh, in ter now, in terms of the M and A, what what kind of opportunities are you looking at? Like, what kind of companies? Or what's what's you know what kind of targets? What's the criteria you have for for M and A? As I mentioned, the number one criteria: if you're not profitable, if you're not an accretive business. Uh, and you don't have tier one partners, multi-billion dollar partners, we're just not interested. But we're not in, going to take the journey of burning capital and waiting. Uh, we want it now. We want to move fast. And we bring huge upside from our side. So we want synergies. So it's like a layer cake. We execute on the acquisition and we build and grow together. And then we go and get the next guy and we continue to consolidate. And we have a whole roadmap planned uh, for 2021 and even into 2022 and you're going to see it. I mean, look at the partners we have now. We deliver and execute time and time again. We have quarterly growth with revenue. We generate revenue every month. We have reoccurring clients. This is the beginning, but I mean, it's all about working with people that have the same passion, that have accretive businesses, that have the same mindset. And we're laser focused on building a billion dollar company. Okay. So I think I think the key kind of takeaway is 
I know you, you're not you're not giving us too much information about the types of companies that, that you're going to be buying. But the key, the one common denominator they must have is they have to be profitable and they have to bring, uh, you know, so, so, you know, basically they have to they have to be like best of breed companies and and profitable. Hundred percent. I want to work with the best. You're not going to get. You're not going to become the best if you're uh, if you're picking up, you know, mid-sized companies or companies that are underperforming. I don't want to have anything to do with that. We want to just work with the best and build, build, build. And you know, I can't get into too many details, but just stay tuned. It's coming. Okay. Uh, kind of right. I got to say the, the 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 two things I like so far is that, you know you're you. You know, this reminds me of, of another company we had where the CEO would always say, stay tuned. And he did say that his goal was to build a billion dollar company. That stock went from 50 cents to $10 also. Because, Canadian, yeah. Canadian, Canadian, US $7. So, so, well, also that company. so we're, we're already, we have a lot of good things happening here. So there's I think, I think Jack, at the, at the end of the day, when you know you're going to deliver and you have things in the pipeline, you're not scared. And we're not scared. We have things in the pipeline and you're going to see it's going to be consistent news releases, consistent deliveries. And we're just excited, man. I hope all the viewers are excited because I'm fired up, man. We're, we're going for it here. Okay. Uh, what, uh, let's jump to some audience questions here. Uh, Phenom is saying, would you be able to, you can see Conrad, you can see the questions on the screen, right? Yep. Okay, so Phenom is saying, uh, would you be able to break down the revenue percentage between the different streams? What brings in the most dough? Yeah, I think it's a pretty even breakdown at the moment. Uh, so there's currently, as it stands right now, uh, digital media rights, advertising, and sponsorships uh, lead the charge. Uh, and I would say that's about 30% of the revenue. Uh, then the rest is split on our e-commerce platform, our tournament digital uh, platform. Uh, and then our sim racing has really had a big uptake. Um, so I would say it's about an even split with those those three. Okay. The um, You know, what's what's interesting is you, you're talking about the digital media rights, the broadcasting, all this stuff. You know, right now, I mean, can you kind of maybe give our audience – you know, some call it because you're you're in the business. I mean, I'm I'm yeah. just read about these things. Like, you know, I see articles with Forbes, you know, they're talking about, you know, there's like kids making I mean, like, you know, 18 year old kids making five million dollars, you know, playing yeah. sports. It's wild. Uh, there's guys on what's that channel? Is it Twitch or something? People are getting paid money, people are paying to watch yeah. them play. They're, they're tipping they're tipping them while they're playing. Yeah. They're generating revenues. They're actually placing ads now within Twitch. And that's what we're getting at. So just to kind of outline it, to really simplify it, I always use traditional sports uh, as a parallel because it's easy to understand. You know, imagine the opportunity. Uh, if I, you told me today, we could all go get the NFL network exclusive rights to broadcast all the NFL games we would be all, none of us would be on the screen right now because we'd be running down the street to go buy them if they're available. That's the opportunity. So these gaming publishers have exclusive digital media rights for specific regions and countries throughout the world. And when I say we have exclusive digital media rights, for example, in the game Rocky League, we had exclusivity with Epic Games for the game Rocky League in Poland. So if you wanted to create a large scale tournament, or broadcast the game Rocky League, you would actually have to go through us because we held those exclusive digital media rights. And we're pursuing more digital media rights uh, throughout Europe and in different countries and regions. Okay, so I mean, the, the business, the eSports, I mean, it's real, it's pure, it's, again, the name, you know, the name of the company is ESE Entertainment. I mean, really, you're in the entertainment business. Yep. People are paying, they're, you know, they're paying money to, yep. to watch eSports, essentially, right? So, so it's a crazy, it's, 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 it's really an incredible phenomenon. Uh, so essentially, you're, you're getting to the broadcasting that there is, uh, what's happening, there's a couple of guys in pro, there's a bunch of guys in pro sports who own teams who have invested in the space uh, in the East. I think they own esports teams or they're doing like, what can you talk about that a little bit just to give people some background? Yeah. I mean, it, it's funny because even when I played pro sports, 
you know, it seemed like a long time ago, but even then we were all playing games, you know, in the off season, we'd be playing Madden and all these different video games. But now the younger generation, all the pros, you know, they're coming out of college at call it 19 to 23 years old. They're all gamers. It's just advanced. And now they're live streaming. So you have superstars like Juju Schuster Smith from the Pittsburgh Steelers. He's on the cover of Sports Illustrated with a gaming headset on. Like if that doesn't tell you something, I mean, it's a mega trend. And we've even brought on professional athletes as ambassadors. Most notably, we signed Evander Kane. He's an NHL superstar uh, and he's an avid gamer as well. And we look to actually add on some more professional athletes. And one thing to note, in Europe, we actually hosted a huge event with FC Barcelona. So we brought FC Barcelona, their esports division, to Poland. Uh, and if you guys aren't familiar with FC Barcelona, you know, that's arguably the biggest sports brand in the world. So that's those the, are the type of groups we work with. Or, yeah, I guess the football, the, in Europe we call it football, but basically yeah. soccer, the biggest soccer team. Biggest soccer team. I mean, that brand speaks for itself, and we did a large-scale event with them uh, in Europe last okay. year. So, so what did you do? You brought them. You brought them to to Poland, and, and for what kind of what was the event? What what did you guys do? So that was for the game Rocket League, and we hosted a tournament between ESE and the FC Barcelona uh, team, and that's something you guys could just jump on Google and have a look. Uh, we were actually posted on their main page, their FC Barcelona uh, football club page. And we got a lot of press from that and uh, something you guys could dive into on your own time. Okay. So that is, uh, so that's pretty interesting. Okay. So, so the big money. Okay. So the, there's, uh, so there's, there's huge money in like broadcast rights and sports, all this other stuff. Uh, and that but, is, yeah. And that's what you're, you're going to be doing with, with esports on, on different platforms, basically. Exactly. And at that's the end of the day, that's just one of your kind of verticals. Yeah. And at the end of the day, we're going to build that world class infrastructure company. So when the groups like FC Barcelona or hopefully the Dallas Cowboys groups like this want to get into this space, they're going to be reaching out to ESE Entertainment to fulfill that back end infrastructure for them because they're just they don't know the steps that they need to take to enter into the market. And it okay. and it's inevitable, right? Yeah. All the pro sports teams are diving into this like you wouldn't believe because they're losing viewership to Gen Z, right? So they need to dive into this space now. Yeah, I especially think, with COVID, there is no games. So I mean, you got no fans anyways. So yeah, you know, I, I I've talked about this because we've had we had a couple of people in the in the space on. We've had uh, you know the guy who runs the ETF, uh, the ETF. So there's the the esports ETF. We've had. Uh, you know, fans unite, and and you know the, the the one of the things that we always talk about is the fact that kind of the the there's a really a, a shift happening, a generational shift where the 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 new the 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 coming generation, the millennials, and after that is they want stuff which they could which they could participate in, which is yeah. they get involved in. So they don't want to just watch, you know. People play and video games. Anybody can more or less play. So it's you know not everybody can play professional football, right? But exactly. you know, anybody can play you know uh, esports, right? So it's something they can relate to. It's it's a much it's a much wider market and, and it's global. It's all global. It's 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 global. It's online. It's COVID proof. It's COVID -proof. I mean you you got to be in the space. I mean, do your research, do your due diligence, but this is a massive mega trend and you got to be involved. And when you see these big groups shifting into it, I mean, it's just a tremendous opportunity. Yeah, I think the, I think the guy from the Dallas, uh, I think there's, who, who's, I'm thinking of the Dallas Cowboys, there's a couple of guys who've gotten into esports in a big way. Also the guy from, uh, what is it, the uh, the Patriots, New England Patriots, I think he, they own an esports. There's, I mean, there, there's tons of uh, examples. I'll use another example. This one's great. So for the game NBA 2K, uh, so when COVID hit, the Phoenix Suns decided to host a tournament, an online NBA tournament. And ironically, on their live Twitch feed, they actually surpassed viewership that they would have at a traditional game. So they had a bigger, a bigger live following watching 
the guys online playing NBA 2K the game than they did at a live event watching the actual team. So wow. it is, I mean, it's the proof's in the pudding. The, the, the stats are out, the analytics are out, follow the trend. You know, you highlighted it earlier. Amazon didn't buy Twitch for fun for 900 million when everyone thought they were crazy. Well, guess what? Like you always say, that's a that's 10x or or who knows how much that's worth now, right? It's follow the trends. Facebook created their own Facebook gaming channel. YouTube has their own YouTube gaming channel. You know, they aren't making these decisions on the fly. This is here to stay and it's just the beginning. Let's let's go to uh, the next audience question here. Uh, Alink, Alink, I think is the, is the name. Uh, can you share with us the roadmap for 2021? Great question, Conrad. What's uh, what's kind of in the pipeline in terms of what can we see happening in terms of forget about even 2021. Let's just say the next couple of months. What's in the in the in the news pipeline? What kind of news flow can we expect? Aggressive approach to our M and A. Pipeline, uh, we're going to be going after those acquisition targets hard and fast uh, and hopefully close uh, as many as we can. And then as it pertains to our operations internally, we already have significant contracts from current clients for 2021, even into 2022. So we're going to continue to build that internal infrastructure, continue to build on those relationships. When you have partnerships with groups like Porsche and Orlin, multi-billion dollar groups, once trust is gained, you can then expand and you have bigger partnerships. You enter into new countries, new regions. So it's going to be a mushroom effect on our business where we're just going to continue to do what we're doing, deliver and grow and build our name and trust in the market. And then obviously, like I said, close some of those acquisition targets and consolidate Europe. That's the goal. Yes. Okay. So, I, so it's an interesting point you made. So once you have like a major brand uh, like Porsche, right? Uh, then it's much easier to, to, to get the next guy on board. And, and, and also that opens up doors to new markets, everything else. Once you know, people see that it adds you know, tremendous credibility to the step to the story. And, and and that's why we want to work with the biggest brands in the world. So why, that, you know, when you work with Porsche, it opens, like you said, the door to Mercedes, the door to Kia, to all these big automotive companies, and they know you can deliver and you've executed and you have the proof to show it. And that, at the end of the day, that's what it comes down to. They have trust. You're going to come in and deliver. Yeah. I was going to say, what's that Roger Federer? I think, uh, what he he he? What is he? He's the he's he's a spokesman for which brands? He does I think the coffee the coffee thing I've seen. Yep. He does coffee? He does uh, Rolex. He does Rolex. Uh, what brand? He's he's got to do like I think like twenty five different brands. He's doing and the same. And these things could all do esports. I mean, people who play esports they love coffee. It's actually funny you mentioned tennis because. They just came out with a game called Tennis Clash, and they had Serena Williams and and all these big names behind it. And they actually did a partnership with Gucci. I mean, we're talking about the tier one brands, right? Yeah, this is tier one. The, you know, they're not hiding. Esports, the League of Legends tournament, uh, they signed a sponsorship with Louis Vuitton. I mean, it's unbelievable. I mean, these are some things that not anybody could anticipate. I wouldn't think of those brands being in the. It's, it's very interesting. That's actually, that's like, a, it's, I mean, they, I, they must see some opportunity. They, they, I guess that might be graphic. Yeah, they want to capture the Gen Z market. And you're not going to capture that market on traditional uh, media or traditional TV channels. You have to dive in, get into the community. That's why it's very common in the esports world to use the word community because it is a community. And that's why it's important to have integrity, to deliver, and to actually execute on your plan. So if you host a tournament or if you have a big prize pool tournament that you actually pay players, you deliver on time, they have a great experience. These are all very important factors. That's why execution delivery is at the highest priority for us. Okay. 
Uh, so a bunch of questions, M and A. How I I think one of the big I guess the, all the questions come down to how are you going to pay for these acquisitions? Well, it it depends on the actual acquisition. I mean, that's a little bit of a loaded question. Depending on the size, uh, if it's a larger size acquisition, we will consider going out and doing a private placement and raising some funds. If it's a smaller acquisition, that we still have some cash available. Uh, within the company and we'll execute uh, with the cash that we have okay but essentially any any type of acquisition any type of MA is going to be accretive it's all going to be companies that are already profitable that are, that are you know exactly themselves absolutely and we want to structure deals uh where it's more focused on shares rather than cash so there's a significant a portion in shares and a smaller portion in cash uh, because it just fits our structure better. And it shows me that the groups that are coming on board are really engaged and they believe in the story. Okay. A uh, couple of questions about betting. Uh, are you going to enter the betting space? It's such an intriguing space. I mean, fans is doing a phenomenal job with it. I know they've been on your show. Um, a little side note, uh, I've worked with Flutter Entertainment, Full Tilt Poker, Poker Stars. I know the space very well. I know a lot of the people in that space. Uh, and we have a, a very high profile director in our company who's uh, very well known in the gaming space. He's one of the top iGaming. So in the gambling space, it's called iGaming uh, lawyers uh, in all of Canada. So I think it's something we need to take a closer look at you know, when the time's right. Um, Pot potential will we'll jump into it okay okay so that's uh you know op very open-ended uh i okay so we got hawaii is asking what u.s company is is equivalent to esc or maybe i guess he's not even the u.s but like what what like kind of like mainstream company is equivalent uh to uh I i'm thinking is it maybe like what's what's the company that is it img i think what what's the big talent agency that bought the ufc i mean you're kind of doing the similar model in a way no it it's funny you mentioned IMG because we already work with them. Um, but I would say from a public listed standpoint, I would say EGLX is a good comparable. We do some different things, but uh, I think they've done phenomenally well. Uh, now they're starting to generate some significant revenues. So I think that'd be a good comparison. Uh, but quite frankly, on the public market side, um, not a lot of comparables there. Uh, and, and we really want to separate from those groups because we want to bring significant revenues uh, and profitability. And that's been a huge challenge for some of those groups. Uh, and we want to change that dialogue. So once again, delivering, bringing revenue and ultimately profitability. Uh, you know, it's, I guess like in, ter in terms, but in terms of like the mainstream world outside of, you know, East, you're, it's very similar to, I'm trying to think of the name, who is the, the, um, the talent agency, you know, the Hollywood agency that bought, uh, they bought the UFC. That's they IMG. That's, it is that's IMG. IMG. Oh, they bought, no, they bought IMG. They bought IMG also, I think. Oh, yeah, rec yeah, recent, yeah, 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 recently IMG got bought up. Okay. But previ previously, IMG purchased the UFC. Okay. Uh, and it's on the tip of my tongue, but I can't remember. They did actually recently just get bought out. Okay. So, they, they I mean, they've, they've been bought at different events, every, So which is kind of like, essentially, you're almost doing, it, it's sort of like, you're because you're right, right now, essentially, ESC is... is you have multiple verticals in the esports yeah. world. So, so just to go back to that, so the company that bought IMG's Endeavor, so Endeavor purchased IMG for two point three billion dollars. Okay, okay, and, and, wait, and then they also got, I think, UFC. It was a whole and, they, yeah in that in that in that package. Yeah, UFC would be in that bundle. Yeah, and other stuff, and I think the way they're look at it is again, it's you have all these opportunities to leverage this sort of content, whether whether it's uh, uh, sponsorship, you know, because there's there's all sorts of new stuff you can do now. It's not just you know, it's it's not ads, it's sponsorships, it's also partnerships, it's all sorts of you know, ma amazing stuff uh, that that you could do uh, in, in the space because there's a lot. Again, there's so many brands that you know they want to reach uh this demographic and esports kind of gives them that you know it serves it up on a platter um let me see i want to ask you um okay so in terms of uh 
So let's, you know, in terms of the, the big picture, like what is, you know, maybe you can share your vision with, with our audience. So what, if, if everything works perfectly, what is ESC going to look like? Let's just say two years from now, 24 months from now, what is the company going to look like uh, if everything goes according to plan? Yeah, like I said from the beginning of the show, we want to build a billion dollar company, but based on fundamentals. So we're going to continue to do what we're doing. We have a proven model that's scalable. We're going to continue to pursue those acquisition targets, and we're going to build the global leader in esports infrastructure. Uh, and it, it's as simple as that. You just continue to execute and deliver and build. Okay. Uh, let's see. We got uh, we got a couple of questions. Okay. So Bo is asking. Can you give us some companies that would be a good fit? I guess he's asking about potential acquisitions. Can you? I don't know if you want to share that. Maybe not. Yeah, I think we'll just keep that a little internal. But you know, like I said, we're pursuing those accretive acquisitions. Okay, so this guy's saying, yeah, for M and A, uh, for sure. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mr. B asking, when will you be profitable? I believe I read somewhere you will prop in twenty. Will you be profitable twenty one? I think, you know, the goal is for 2021, uh, but it just depends on how we scale and, and how fast we consolidate different regions because it obviously does affect uh, profitability. But we're going to be near that range in 2021 because we're going to be starting to pile on some revenue here. Okay. So, yeah, so this is it's very interesting. So entertainment assets. Yeah, there it is, yeah. I, I guess I would call these like, you know, you know uh, what is, uh, you know, UFC, is that – teams all these like entertainment assets i mean these things can trade at massive massive yeah. valuations which are, are are not related to the actual revenue so it's like the 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 the, the multiple the valuation can almost be whatever you want yeah with, within a reason we're not gonna but i mean like look well, at, the, no it's but that's exciting that's a yeah, great that's comment a, no, sky, no. sky potential and you, you know what is what did, i'm trying to think of what are some of the teams uh, what is the, I'm trying, like, I, so, the, I, so the, your, yeah, your viewer brought on a great point. So let's use example of cloud nine, for example, you know, I saw recently in Forbes, I'm sure it's updated now, but they had a couple hundred million dollar valuation us dollars. And that's the exciting part. So with our gaming franchise kick, you know, you have the opportunity to build this team equivalent to cloud nine or equivalent to like the Dallas Cowboys. I mean, these are opportunities that just do not come up, uh, you know, in my opinion, anytime. I mean, this is a boom. Like, I mean, if I had the opportunity to buy the Dallas Cowboy for a few million bucks, I mean, I don't think we'd be on the show right now. Right. No, no. This is, this is, so this is the amazing thing. Like, I think what, what's, what did uh, Steve Ballmer, he bought, was it the LA Clippers? Clippers. And then most oh, yeah. recently, um, uh, Cohen just bought, the, the New Met. York Mets for, for multi-billion dollar purchase. But the, and these teams are not making money, are they? They're not making no. money. Ver, or very a lot, a lot. Yeah, I mean, it's, and if they are, it's really thin margins. And that's old school. I mean, ba I don't even, you know, like, I don't think, does anybody even watch baseball? I mean, I don't think like young people watch baseball. Uh, you know, it's like, I mean, actually, I, swear, I, I was in a, I was in a, a, a restaurant that had a baseball, and to me, it looks so old fashioned, those uniforms and everything. I was like, Who's gonna? Be, who's watching this stuff? And like, you know, esports basically, I, like, you know, it's interesting. Kind of what you just said. Actually, all of a sudden, it's, it's starting to kind of crystallize. Essentially, this is really like it's like getting in on the ground floor of. Yep. You just put, you add up, uh, you know, football, uh, uh, baseball, hockey, everything. All those old, old sports. That is esports now. So the, right now, we have kind of like this blue sky, this wide open opportunity to to kind of you know, create these massive, you know, these assets right now. And it, and it's, it's first mover advantage. And you know, we're in Europe, a monstrous market, 750 million plus people in that market. As I mentioned in my presentation, there's a three, a 580 plus million online presence in Europe. And we're right in the thick of it. Right. And it's prime for consolidation. You want an opportunity? That's an opportunity. 
you know, our online tournament platforms operating out of Southeast Asia, there's 170 million gamers in that market. Yeah. I right. mean, it's, it's astronomical opportunity. And like you said, it's big blue sky. These opportunities do not come around. It's now. And I'm just glad to be in the position that we're in. We moved fast, we delivered, and now we're primed for growth. Okay, let's, uh, okay, so we got a question. Alulu is asking, what are the future plans for Kick, which you just announced recently? Yeah. And just maybe just recap, what, is, what does Kick do in the, in the plans? Yeah, Kick is, Kick is super exciting. Uh, Kick is a professional esports team. Uh, and they participate in the games, League of Legends, Apex, and FIFA. Um, we have one of the top League of Legends teams in all of Europe, one of the best FIFA players in the world. Uh, and our Apex team just finished third in all of Europe in a recent tournament. So our future plans, we're actually in the middle of uh, upgrading our uh, website and really building out our you know, infrastructure that pertains to the e-commerce site. And then we want to slowly start adding new teams, uh, acquiring better players, more competitive players, so we can enter into larger tournaments, and then hopefully enter those tournaments that have those multi-million dollar prize pools. And that's the ultimate goal, is to be competing head-to-head -head with the Cloud Nines of the world, the FaZe Clans, all these big names. Uh, we want to be that next big global esports brand. But, but the revenue, the, I mean, the revenue opportunities for, for owning a, the team, it's not just the prize. It's really the brand, the sponsorship. Exactly, exactly. It could be more, much more money. Even. I mean, the prize. So you have, you have team sponsorships, just like you see in, you know, traditional sports where they have branding on the shoulders, on the chest of the jersey. Uh, and we already have secured tier one sponsors there. And then there's advertising. So our players go on and they live stream. They're in commercials. You know, they're doing product placement. There's huge affiliate opportunities with groups like Razor and some other groups we've worked with in the past. It's the same as, you know, traditional sports. I mean, there's tremendous opportunities for advertising and sponsorship. Actually, much more because it's 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 like, you know, I, I call esports because all digital is you don't have that. Yeah, there's no restrictions. There's no restrictions. All that old stuff with the stadium, you know, like, you know, all that crap that you need for physical sports. Uh, what the Zen he's asking, do players earn stock? Good question. Do they do you pay them stock? You give them options? How do you pay these guys? No, they do not. Uh, so they have salaries uh, and they get a split of the earnings in tournaments. So Mr. B is saying more people were playing Fortnite pre Super Bowl than people who watched. So oh, yeah, watch yep. the Super Bowl. Uh, do you own any Fortnite team? So we're looking into Fortnite, uh, but that part of the business Pedro is really diving into. We're considering Fortnite and potentially CSGO as another game that we might enter. But currently, um, it's not a core focus. We really want to build out our current teams and build the infrastructure within. So build out the e-commerce platform, our new website. We just launched the new app, Kick App. Feel free to download that to follow our team. I actually encourage everybody to go follow us on Twitter, follow us on Instagram. They got a great page and you guys can keep up track of what we're doing. Okay, perfect. Uh, Conrad, we're, we're, all, we're pretty much, I mean, we're, we're almost out of time here. I wanna ask you uh, one last question here. Uh, which is always you know, our favorite question to ask uh, at the Wall Street Reporter. So in your opinion, you know, what are the top three reasons why investors you know, should want to own ESC stock today? I mean, esports is a mega trend. It's absolutely massive, multi-billion dollar industry, like we mentioned. And we're on the ground floor. We're, we have that first mover advantage. And then as it pertains to our actual stock, once again, ground floor, we just listed a few months ago. You could get in early and be a part of the journey towards, you know, creating this billion dollar company. And then three, at the end of the day, we're delivering. You want to be a part of a group that's continuing to deliver, continuing to generate revenue and grow quarter over quarter. And that has partners like like I mentioned, Porsche, Amazon, all these big groups. I mean, 
I really believe in what we're doing. And I think we're the stock that you should be uh, looking at, tag, taking a closer look at. Okay. Uh, excellent. So Conrad, um, on that note, um, you know, thank you for, 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 you know, sharing the story today. Uh, we got a lot of, we got a lot of people on, on the stream. We got, this is, we got YouTube, we got uh, Periscope, Twitch. See, look, you're, Facebook. you're like a gamer. We're so great. Smart. Yeah. Except I'm not getting tips. I'm not getting those. What do they, they get the <laughs> tips or something? <laughs> So, so maybe, uh, yeah. maybe something we could uh, implement. We gotta later add, that. We gotta add that. I think they have super chat, right? The super chat yeah. on YouTube. Uh, that that's what we gotta add. We gotta add multiple revenue streams here, and then we'll have teams. Always. So so kind of okay. So next week, I think we're gonna have you back for follow up. We're gonna have a lot of. I think we're gonna have a lot of questions by then because yeah. usually our first live stream, we do, you know, just people kind of get to know you a little bit, then. You know, the audience builds, and then uh, you know. So, uh, and then and we'll we'll, we'll uh, go we'll go from there. So, again, Conrad, thank you, and thank you everybody for joining our live stream today. And we'll see you on the next one. Thanks so much, Jack. It was a pleasure to be on, and we're fired up to be on next week. And hopefully, there'll be lots to talk about. And yeah, let's. And you know, I'd we we need the stock. We need the follow up when the stock gets to five dollars. That's the main thing. That's what the audience is is you know. Yeah, we're, we're we're demanding now. They're they're very they're very high standards. We're working day and night, man. Monday you, through Conrad. Sunday, three sixty five. <laughs> I love it. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. All right, guys, have a great day. Thanks for tuning in.